welcome everyone. My name is, is John Roberts. I have the pleasure to be the, uh, the co-chair of the ICA's expert group on managing digital and physical records, uh, which is uh, co-hosting the session over the next few days with Hira, the hub for AI research in, in archives. And I'm coming to you today from Toronto, Canada. Uh, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, uh, the Anishinaabe, uh, and the Mississaugas of the, the Credit. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge those uh, traditional Indigenous uh, owners of the land uh, on which I have the privilege of uh, living and working. Uh, and for many of you, uh, the issues of uh, Indigenous land interests will also be uh, be very relevant. So I just urge uh, uh, anyone to reflect on the, the history of the, the land uh, on which they stand and from which they are joining the session today. Uh, again, just a, a reminder that uh, I think over the last couple of years, we've all become far more familiar with the uh, appropriate etiquette for, uh, for webinars and calls over uh, the video channels. So uh, just a reminder to, to please Keep microphones off for uh, for questions uh, and, and commentary uh, during the, the later part. Uh, please use the the raise hand feature so that we can uh, we can identify folk who want to, to contribute. Uh, but of course, throughout the, the sessions, please feel free to uh, to add any comments and reactions using the uh, the chat features as well. Um, over the next. Uh, three days, we do have a, a very extensive uh, program of uh, uh, contributions. And of course, Wednesday's session is, uh, uh, as you'll have noticed, a, a working session for uh, really trying to, to look at how do we not just think about uh, the issues of uh, artificial intelligence in archival appraisal and selection, but, but really start to, to codify and, and share some, um, some thinking that will, will help us move into this territory. Uh, but to help us get to that point uh, over the next two days, we've got uh, a number of very uh, uh, informed speakers who have been uh, engaging with this, uh, this issue uh, in their uh, professional lives to help uh, seed some of that, that discussion. So uh, uh, our first speaker, Today is uh, Antheosellus, who uh, uh, I think needs probably very little introduction to the archival community. Uh, Anthea was a, a known face through her, uh, uh, her work uh, with uh, the, the National Archives in, in the UK before taking on the role uh, where she was I think, most uh, visible to us all uh, as Secretary General of the ICA over the, the last few years, uh, a role from which she has uh, recently moved on to work with artifactual systems. So going from uh, institutional through the, the oversight of our community writ large uh, and, and back, we were just talking before, uh, to getting her hands dirty on some real projects uh, uh, in this space. And throughout that, uh, uh, that prominent career, issues of technology, uh, and reflections about how emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence have uh, uh, have very much been at the front of Anthea's uh, research and, and professional contributions. So uh, to kick us off with a, a bit of a, I guess, a, an overview about the, the opportunities and challenges around uh, AI in this space, um, uh, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Anthea Sellis for, uh, uh, for the opening part of this webinar. So Anthea, over to you. Thank you so much, John, and it's a real privilege uh, to be able to be with you today. So let me see if we can get the presentation up and running. And thank you. Oh. Sorry, there we go. Okay. Um, so today I'll be talking to you a bit about the use of AI in appraisal and selection. So looking at uh, potential and the challenges in deploying these types of technologies uh, in, our, in our regular practice. So this is a, 
the presentation I've given in various flavors uh, over the course uh, of the years that I was both Secretary General and while I was at National Archives UK. And many of my insights uh, are from the work I did at National Archives UK and continuing research uh, that I continue to do in this area, as well as conversations I've had with colleagues uh, in the international community around the application of AI in appraisal and selection. Um, and these also are part, uh, I've also worked closely with Rebecca Bayek, who is hosting this, uh, this particular webinar series, and uh, it's part of HIRA, which is the hub for artificial intelligence research. And so I'd encourage you to follow HIRA on Twitter if you uh, are inclined to learn more about different issues that they will be exploring. Uh, and so we will get started. So really, the overview is really quite simple for this presentation. I'm going to talk a bit about what is artificial intelligence. Um, I'd like, I like to sort of contextualize what it is that we're talking about, because AI can be quite a broad, be quite a broad term, and, but it has a lot of sub areas that need to be, I think, discussed if we're really going to have a meaningful conversation around AI. Could I just ask that everybody make sure that their microphones are muted, please? Thank you. Uh, and then I'll get into considerations and opportunities about appraisal and selection using AI in this area. So um, artificial intelligence can be defined in many different ways. There really is no standard definition. I think we use it uh, to uh, to incorporate both machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. Um, and so, uh, pardon the mistake there, there are really sort of three main categories uh, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence. I'm not going to get into deep neural networks in this particular presentation because I think what we're dealing with as an archival community is really what we can actually buy off the shelf because I think that's where we are right now. I don't think we necessarily have at this point uh, the technical capabilities to be able to develop our own AI systems, but that of course brings with it its own challenges. So there are really three areas. So there's supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So supervised requires a human to mark up or compile uh, a set of data to train an algorithm to recognize patterns or terms in that data. So for example, if I want a machine to recognize uh, place names, specific place names, I need to tell, I need to mark up a data set and tell the machine this is what I'm looking for. And then there is an iterative process of relearning and training, or not relearning, but training the machine to identify what it is that you are looking for. Then there's unsupervised. So this is instances where you will take your data and just put it in a machine and it will already sort of be pre-programmed with to identify specific types of information uh, and it will arrive at an output. The area I'm starting to look at more and more, given, and this is really, I think, germane to the discussion around appraisal and selection, is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is what is used in the financial industry uh, and in gaming. And what it is, is that it is both a subset of supervised and unsupervised. Um, and the reason I think reinforcement learning for appraisal and selection is much more meaningful is that uh, in reinforcement, you build off the data set that you've already tagged because we also need to acknowledge that the materials that we are going to appraise and select will change over time. They're not static. And with AI, there's a certain level, or depending on which uh, component of AI that you're using, there's a level of expectation that the data will remain the same and it, is, it won't remain the same. Whereas with reinforcement learning, what it does is that it enables you to build off of the data that you've already trained the machine to do, and then it helps you then hopefully on the fly, I need to, again, I'm still researching this, but, and then on the fly, enable you to identify other terms, other events, other things that need to be considered in a new data set that you might input into AI to help you do, or machine learning, to help you do appraisal and selection. So um, that's a really sort of quick and, and uh, quick and dirty, a definition of what artificial intelligence is and the subsets to artificial intelligence. I think the opportunities for AI and appraisal and selection, so I think we need to recognize that the volume of data being generated by records creators across multiple platforms um, is far outstripping our abilities to apply traditional appraisal and selection techniques. Our creators are, and especially I think as COVID 
has uh, forced our institutions and our organizations to move into a online environment. Um, the types of platforms they're using and the, the sort of dispersal of information across multiple platforms um, is going to be challenging when it comes to one, retrieving the information to do appraisal and selection, or even to be able to point artificial intelligence uh, software to these types of platforms for very security reasons. But nonetheless, we will have vast amounts of data that we will need to process. And AI enables us to do that because we're not going to have the nice, neat folders that we used to have with paper appraisal. And I think too, um, particularly with digital, it often helps us at a first pass describe or understand data that is often poorly organized and described. If I take the example, and I'll talk a bit more about it, uh, what I saw when I was working in National Archives, is that once digital information loses its, its currency within an institution or an organization, and it becomes what we would classify as semi-active, it often gets put sometimes depending on where you are, it's put in a shared drive or it's put in offline storage and people forget about it. And with the high turnover in a lot of institutions, what that means is that people forget what the contents of those records are. And depending on the levels of record keeping that may or may not exist, you may have a very difficult time then understanding what's actually in those folders. And the people who are working there may not be able to tell you either. They're just gonna be like, well, that's just the stuff we, we knew that, you know, Jerry left us and now we have no idea what's in it. And so artificial intelligence allows us to help our creators sometimes get a first understanding of what's actually in a set of, of unknown data. Um, and it can process, I think, really at scale. Now, when I talk about processing at scale though, I think we need to be mindful of where we are locating this machine. Artificial intelligence, machine learning takes a lot of processing power. So you can say, and it, you know, these are conversations that you're gonna have to have with your institution from the outset, when if you wanna apply these technologies to uh, parse over your records holdings. If it's very small, if you don't have a lot of data, then okay, putting it on premise or having it with or contained within your organization is fine. If you have a lot of data to process and data that may be in very disparate, uh, not necessarily on your corporate servers, then the cloud may be the better option. But there's a lot of reservations uh, from various organizations for various reasons about putting these types of applications in the cloud. So these are questions around information security that you will need to talk about with your organizations. Um, but the thing is, is that the bigger the data set, the more processing power you're going to need. And sometimes the cloud is the easiest way to, uh, in the call off model to be able to process over large amounts of information. A lot of institutions aren't gonna want to dedicate the amount of resource, uh, it, infrastructural and technological resource to be able to do it in their own house. So it's something that we need to be mindful of about applying AI. It's both an opportunity and can be a constraint depending on the organization that you're working for. Depending on the data, it can enable more, uh, even an evidence-based decision-making around appraisal and selection decisions. There's a lot of discussions when we talk about appraisal and selection that it's an art more than a science. I think that um, it will depend on the type of information that we're looking for in the record. I think when we talk about appraisal and selection, we tend to focus on date and that can be slightly problematic when you're trying to use that as a metric using machine learning. And I'll talk a bit why there's complications around date. And I think too, um, it will also depend on the types of, of events that you're looking for. And in other types, if you're just looking for personal information or natural language processing, I think that that is much easier to make decisions around because you have established algorithms that exist, sort of natural language processing algorithms, regular expressions that can help you identify that information. Um, and I'll talk a bit about some of the challenges um, around uh, doing context-based or using machine learning for context-based identification for appraisal and selection. But it can give us an, the ability to be more even in our decision-making, I hope. And, but we do need audit trails in order to document that. Partly also because these machines don't get tired. There's very valid evidence uh, that exists 
uh, around the around how humans process large amounts of digital information. Um, and I've I've forgotten the the uh, particular research that was done, but essentially what the the research was saying was that on the first few pages that a, a human will be looking at digitally around information, they'll be paying a lot of attention on the first two or three pages. But over time, they get tired. We're humans, like we're not, we're not machines. We we get tired and sometimes we we miss information and sometimes we glance over information because it is quite tiring. And this was a discussion we had a lot when we were talking about more of the, not necessarily the technology, but the ancillary needs around doing uh, processing large amounts of, or having to look at large amounts of data as a human being uh, around the ergonomics of doing digital review. Um, and so humans get tired. And so there are certain things about using an opportunity around artificial intelligence is around using the machine's ability that it doesn't get tired. And it can process when you're giving it regular types of information, like personal information, regular expressions, it doesn't get tired. It will go through that data and the output generally will be pretty even. It doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect, but it'll be pretty even and it'll be pretty exact. And you may need to do some retraining to make sure that the machine uh, will identify with a greater accuracy and precision the information that you're looking for. But in some areas, the machine can be infinitely better than a human being. So it's acknowledging both the strengths and the weaknesses of the machine when we look at opportunities. And I know I get this question a lot. It does not mean that the archivist will be rendered irrelevant. Okay, so just, I'm gonna put that out there because I know this is a concern of the, that the community has. We had similar conversations in the 1980s when we deployed personal computers. There was a huge level of concern that, you know, office workers would be made obsolete. We're all sitting here. We're all still doing our jobs. You know, 30 years, 30 years later, I don't think we're, it's gonna, we're gonna be made obsolete anytime soon. So the impact, I think it's worth mentioning of information management systems, because this impacts our ability on how we efficiently deploy AI and exploit the opportunities that AI machine learning brings. So information management systems that have been put in place in the past have not always been easy to use, and they have been really rigid in some instances, which means that users have found other ways, and this is my experience both at National Archives and what I've seen internationally, users have found other ways to get around these rigid systems. In particular, when, share, they've been, when shared drives have been left in place. And what they do is that they end up using the shared drives over using the information management system. And, we care, and this is all documented in some research that we carried out. Now it's, can't believe it's, been, it's starting to get dated now. Um, you know, it's, it's seven, uh, seven years ago. I can't, I'm seven, eight years ago. Um, that we looked at this particular research, at this particular issue, but I think it still stands today we still have this issue of if, if information management systems are too rigid or if, they, if there's too many demands put on the users, the end users, they're not either gonna do what we're asking of them or they're gonna find a way to circumvent it, which is gonna make our job a lot easier. And there was a big discussion when I was in UK government about how do we make our record keeping processes more seamless, more easier for the user to participate in without overburdening them with having to put in all sorts of metadata or having to check certain boxes. Because the moment you add layers of, of administration and record keeping, it, you're, not, you're gonna have a very difficult time making sure that you capture the right records without having the users try and find a workaround. So what we found was the impact of these sort of rigid systems and then, but then allowing the existence of share drives at the same time is that for every terabyte that we were seeing in an information management system, there was about 25 terabytes that was sitting in a shared drive. So what is 25 terabytes? What does that mean? Um, and this is not, does not include data held, uh, does not include data sets or information held in email servers. That's a whole nother kettle of fish. So this was simply in the information management environment and in the shared drive environment. So what we, the approximation we made was that for every one terabyte equaled 1 million Word documents, approximately. And so if you think that there's 25 terabytes of 25 million records, there's no way a human being can review that. When you throw in the data sets and the emails, the email servers, it becomes 1.5 petabytes. And that's about 1.5 billion Word documents. That's a huge amount of data to be able to try and review. 
And as I said, you know, information management teams did not know it was contained in legacy re record holdings and did not know what documents or data needed to be preserved. They completely lost sight of it. And this is where AI helped us, at least in a first pass, when we're trying to do appraisal and selection, because the inclination for the user is it's too big and I can't handle it. And what machine learning does is at least initially it gives you an understanding of types of file formats, uh, date ranges, but you know, date ranges, you need to be a bit, you need to critically evaluate that. Um, and because the metadata itself is not necessarily indicative of the, the actual date of the records. And I will give you an example. And this is where using AI or machine learning, you need to be really, you, you need to do some contextual research before you start making appraisal and selection decisions. So these machines are not perfect. They're just gonna tell you what they are seeing, particularly off the shelf commercial software. You also need to be mindful of that these machines, especially around date, make decisions. So they're reasoning through what is the most accurate date. So you need to be careful when you're looking at the results of machine learning for, art of, for appraisal and selection. So the example I'll give you is we had a department. They said they had materials from the 19, around 1995, 1997. We, put, we did a first pass with some machine learning, but we were seeing records from 2000 and we were like, we don't understand. We're not seeing any material from the early 90s or mid 90s rather. And then they said, oh, well, yes, but that's in 2000 was when we implemented our first information management system. And you have to appreciate at the time people didn't understand about stabilizing dates. And so essentially um, what ended up happening is that the machine, when they did the migration, is that the, the date of migration was taken in by all of the records. So we could now not use any of the dates in the metadata to identify the records that were supposed to be appraised and selected and transferred to National Archives. So we had to find other means. Now dates can exist in many different forms for those of you that worked in, with digital uh, records, which is that it can be in the title of the record, it can be in the record itself, and it can be expressed in many different ways. But this is how you can train the machine to look at all these instances. So this is where the machine the strength of the machine is because you can you can teach it to look at all the permutations of date to help you be able to retrieve the record set. It's still a lot of work, but it shows you where the strengths of the machine are and where the weaknesses of the machine are and where the archivist still needs to do some contextual research to be able to understand the contents uh, before they apply machine learning. So speaking of what machines do well and what humans do well, so machines, Boolean search, keyword searches, these are sort of baked into any basic machine learning data analytics software that you will look at that's off the shelf. Regular expressions, they can do that really easily because it's regularly expressed if you think of a national identification number, of a visa card number, of a date, depending on what part of the world you're in because dates are expressed in different ways in different parts of the world. But this can, the machine can do this. These are types of things that it can easily do. Identify names, identify places, data training, but it can do that fairly easily. And our research demonstrated that it, you know, was hitting about 80% to 85%. Um, and it can process at scale. What the machines do not do, and this is where we need the archivist or we need uh, somebody, an end user is, it does not understand context and it cannot infer. It's, it's, it, that's not the strength of the machine because context changes. The conditions or the, the events that you may be looking for may be expressed in different ways. And it also can't reason through very sensitive information. Handwriting analysis, I would say that it, the, this is getting better, but it's still not a huge strength of a lot of off the shelf commercial software. I think you've got instances within the community where you've got some good handwriting and uh, anal uh, analytic algorithms that are out there. So, and I think that it's a question of how do we take off the shelf machine learning software and allow the algorithms that we've developed in this community around handwriting analysis and plug it in. What humans do well, well, we definitely don't process at scale very well, but we do understand and infer context and we can do handwriting analysis pretty well, depending on, you know, the handwriting. Um, and I think understanding and inferring context becomes extremely important when you're looking, at least from our experience, at sensitivity. Uh, because in one context, the way something is expressed may not be sensitive. And in another context, the way that it is expressed can be sensitive. And the machine can't always understand that. 
And although many service providers will tell you, well, it can do co-location, it can do all these reasoning, it, it's not the same. You need a human to be able to do that. I think some of the real constraints and the considerations when we talk about machine learning around appraisal and selection is the significant amount of time required to train the system. It is, do not underestimate that. That can take a lot of time and different service providers will give you different answers. They will tell you if, if you wanna identify a subject matter, it'll take you 30,000 tags on that particular subject matter to train the machine. Others will tell you it's just five tags per subject matter. There is no agreement across, uh, across the service provider spectrum about what is enough training to get a level of precision and accuracy that you are comfortable with. And that is challenging, but that amount of tagging to train the machine is a huge amount of work. So you need to plan for that upfront investment, which a lot of people are not willing, and a lot of organizations are not willing to do what they want to do is capitalize on the automation that's already pre-built into these systems. The problem is, is that these systems have been trained to do specific things that are not necessarily in line with appraisal and selection and what we are trying to achieve and do. So it's something to be mindful of as you get into this area. Understanding how the machine reasons through some of the metadata. So I gave you an example about date. Also how it defines certain things, particularly if you're looking at file formats, because sometimes what these machines will do is that they will say, this is an, uh, this is an unidentified file format. Simply because it's unidentified by the machine does not mean it's not a worthwhile file format to consider. It's just that it doesn't have enough information to be able to identify. And you have to remember that a lot of these machines that you're going to be using are going to be used for e-discovery or data analytics. So they're trained for specific communities and for specific environments. Understanding the reliability. So understanding precision and recall is definitely something that as a community we need to think about because it's never going to be 100%. And we expect, and some of our organizations expect that it will be. It was never 100% in paper. It will not be 100% in a digital environment. I think the issue in the digital environment is discoverability of the information. And so the question for us becomes, how do we mitigate? How will, you know, if there's, if there's a 15% chance that you've missed something, how do we mitigate that? And there was a lot of discussions, and it's something I continue, I continue to consider as we look at machine learning, is what is the thing, is a sliding scale of if I have to, if I'm going to lose information. So I'm looking at this from a government perspective, and it may vary according to your organizations. But if, if, I, if something gets out around national security or international relations, that's a bigger issue for me than personal information. So there are sliding scales of, you know, the types of information and the sensitivity of the information that may come into play and how we manage precision recall and how we manage um, uh, the risk appetite and mitigate that risk appetite. There's sometimes difficulties understanding visualizations generated by machines. So I talked about the question around date um, and the decisions that the machine makes around date and format, which can be quite, uh, which can become quite complicated and may influence or, you know, we need to be clear about what these machines are doing. Um, and machines also come in with built-in programming. So whilst I talk about that we would need to do supervised training, it's that some of these machines come in and make presumptions about how we want to process the information. So even if I talk about, I don't know, e-discovery software, you can still put information into an e-discovery software uh, application and it'll give you an answer. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but it'll give you an answer. And that's the same thing with supervised algorithms is that it'll give you an answer. But the question is, is that the answer that you need? And is that an accurate answer? So just a quick sort of overview. So this is an example of sometimes what you will see in certain data analytics software. So you'll see here you know, the material starts in 2005, but there are questions as well. You need to consider that, you know, if it, because it's looking at the size of the records. And the issue here is that in like the early 1990s, the size of the information was infinitely small. So you need to be careful when you're looking at these visualizations. And again, it's understanding how these machines are processing. And you can see here that they've got an unrecognized format. Well, what does that mean? What is other document? So understanding how these machines are processing is something we need to think about if we're going to engage in this. 
I think another thing we need to think about as well as a community is archival codes of ethics. You know, they really need to be studied and revised to come in line and to try and help us as a community define what we're going to do around emerging technologies. There's a huge amount of work that's been done around algorithmic accountability and transparency and how particularly corporations and machine uh, businesses rather need to be accountable for how their machines arrive at results or must disclose the working of their algorithms. And I think this is particularly important from a government context where, pol where policies and decisions are being made using algorithms. So I've put some, there's the declaration, one of the first ones by, was by the Association of Computing Machinery, followed by the Montreal Declaration, and also the EU regulations and principles around the application of AI and the ability of citizens within the EU to correct their information, particularly if AI is being used to make a, a decision on them and, and the services or the, the, the related policies that are being developed. So in conclusion, Automation is really no longer a choice for us. It's a necessity. However, that doesn't make humans or archivists irrelevant in this process. We are key. As I said, we are the only ones that can really reason through, uh, particularly when we talk about context-based uh, inferences. It's, that's up to us. The machine can't do that. It's not sophisticated enough to do that. The challenges with automating appraisal and selection along with sensitivity review is it's really about how do you measure accuracy and what does good enough look like? And what are the risks and what is the acceptable risk appetite? We need to look at how, um, how can we be responsible for the decisions that are made based, like how do we hold the, the algorithm to account and also how we hold ourselves to account. And I think there's a whole area around how do we define our processes as a community when we engage with these technologies and use these technologies for, uh, uh, for appraisal and selection. And how do we compensate for the change in the digital records over time? Because we're going to have to retune the algorithm. And this is where I really feel reinforcement learning is more, more relevant than simply talking about a very black and white, supervised, unsupervised. Because reinforcement learning encompasses both supervised and unsupervised. Because we can't continuously go back and retrain the machine every time we have a new set of records that we have to deal with. But I think more importantly, too, is we risk biasing the historical record if we're not careful. And I think we risk biasing it in many different ways. And this is, the, I think, the, probably the biggest challenge of these machines. Um, because they're black boxes, we can't necessarily lift the hood and see what's underneath and what the algorithm is doing, because that's proprietary. But I think, too, it's about accepting bias within historical records. And I think there's going to be a discussion about this uh, tomorrow around accepting levels of accepting bias. Our records are a reflection of a space and a time in which our organizations and in which our society existed. And we can't be compensating for that. It needs to exist as it is. I think that if we start compensating for biases that exist in our records, is that we potentially can compromise you know, uh, restorative justice processes. We can compromise just generally um, the, uh, legal processes, rest, uh, restitution, because these records, you know, our institutions at different points in time have been racist, have been sexist, have been a lot of not nice things, but that needs to be present in the record because it's a reflection of where that society, where that organization was at a given point in time, and they need to be held accountable for that. Um, and I would rather see us point to other records that existed at that time, rather than try and bring those records in to compensate for the bias that exists. Um, so that in, it generally is, is what I'm thinking around, uh, around uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and I hope that it is helpful and interesting to you. And I look forward to the next few days, which I think is gonna be a really great conversation. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna hand off back to John. Thanks, Anthea, for that, uh, that wonderful overview and, uh, and kind of kicking us off with uh, yeah, uh, a, great, uh, a great sort of setup presentation, I think, for the next couple of days. You, you mentioned uh, uh, bias there, there at the end, a nice teaser for tomorrow. I think we'll be doing a little bit more of a deep dive into uh, some of the issues around, um, around bias uh, in this space. Uh, lots of things that I've jotted down there as questions that I think we'll try and come back to in the panel discussion later. So 
for all the folk on the call, if I can ask you, rather than trying to ask questions now, please uh, hold hold those thoughts or, or potentially pop things uh, in the chat that we can we can come back to. Uh, we're not going to do Q and A after each uh, presentation, but really try to use that as part of the the discussion um, at the end. So, uh, thanks again, Anthea, and uh, with that, I will move on to our second presentation for today's uh, content. Uh, well, I'm delighted to have some colleagues from uh, the National Archives uh, in the UK uh, joining us. Um, and I believe we have uh, uh, three folk. Mark Bell, uh, Senior Digital Researcher at, at TNA and uh, with a, a mandate across a whole lot of different uh, uh, digital pieces, including but not limited to selection and description. Uh, Dr. Santalata Venkata, uh, who uh, has uh, you know, a very uh, long CV in this area of uh, uh, computer science uh, and, uh, and, and AI prior to, to joining uh, the National Archives, uh, where she's working as a digital preservation specialist. Uh, and finally, uh, Paul Young, uh, uh, who is also a digital preservation specialist and researcher uh, with, with TNA. Uh, again, like all of these uh, colleagues with uh, a very strong resume in, in this area. So um, thank you for joining us. I would like to give a big shout out to, to Jeff Jones and the, and the team at TNA for their, their strong commitment over, over many years to issues of digital archives and digital record keeping uh, through the the, the history of really getting hands dirty on uh, on digital preservation as that ev that has evolved uh, and now engaging with the the whole sort of AI data ethics uh, discourse coming out of places like the Turing Institute and, and other uh, uh, other institutions uh, in in Britain and the in the EU and, and beyond. So uh, with that, I, I will hand over uh, to. Uh, to Paul, uh, Centalata and, and Mark for uh, to set the conversation further around uh, AI and digital selection and appraisal. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Um, thanks for inviting us to speak here. It's uh, really nice to talk about this project which we've been doing at the National Archives called the AF Selection. I'm just going to share my screen. So hopefully people can see that. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Um, so today me and my colleagues are going to talk about a project we did at the National Archives called AI for Selection. Um, before we get into the details of that project, I just want to frame the sort of problem which we're looking at, which Amphi did as well, very uh, nicely. Um, but we're aware of uh, the sort of growing digital heap of government data, which is which is existing in UK government. Um, the Better Information for Better Government project, which was part of the Cabinet Office, um, estimated in 2018, but we had over 16 billion emails and 3 billion documents in UK government, and it will be exponentially more by now. Um, so this sort of scale of this data provides issues. We've had Government departments in the UK are responsible for uh, selecting the digital records, which are due to be transferred to the National Archives after 20 years, or preferably earlier for digital material. Um, but because of the scale, it provides difficulties in using the sort of traditional techniques which they have done for paper records. So we've been looking at potential automated solutions which could assist. Um, so the AI for selection project um, was looking at specifically at AI. Uh, this builds on the previous survey, which uh, Amphia will be well aware of, um, which looked at technology existed review on rules based e discovery project products, um, which looked at appraisal and selection and sensitivity of review of material. This project focuses prime exclusively on selection. Um, and it aimed to understand the current sort of commercial ML projects, so machine learning projects, which are available to look at this issue. So we're looking more at the supervised um, uh, methods which could be used um, to aid with selection. 
Um, so we wanted to see what the market looked like at the moment, um, both just to sort of date this, um, the project ran from 2019 to 2020. And, and this is an area which changes quickly. Um, so to give you an idea of how the pro project run, um, a market researcher was brought in externally to TNA to sort of look at the marketplace and see what tools were available. Um, they created a list and five commercial products were included in the, the main project to sort of examine how they would get on. Um, we used our own data as a public record body ourselves. So we transfer material to ourselves. Um, um, so we used corporate data, which was labeled by our records management team um, on their retention schedules. Um, so we validated the products on how accurate they were, but we also looked at a selection of additional requirements, such as um, how the data was collected into the systems, uh, how they could be customized and the sort of user interfaces. Um, we were quite careful to frame this in, but we weren't looking to decide which was the best product or, or, or even what the best approach may be. It was more of an understanding of what was available and, and what could be done. Um, so we didn't like rank the products or anything. Um, so to give you an understanding of the data we used, um, it was quite a large data set, around 100,000 documents, but it was pre-existing at the National Archives. Uh, so it was created by our records management team. Uh, it was listed with retention schedules, which included whether the material would be selected for preservation or not. Um, so because of the sort of timeline of the project, it, project it was very useful to have this data but it came with its own issues in that it wasn't if you were running this project for real um, to actually use it to select material um, there may be issues with um, how representative the data was in that uh, there might be you, it was sort of quite low in some areas of, of having representative some categories of data um, or if your slides are meant to be advancing, we're not seeing it, we're still on the title slide. Oh, good. It's still on the first one, eh? Okay. I will try exiting that and redoing it. Is it still staying the same or has it gone back to? I'm just seeing the, the title slide still. I'm going to try stop sharing and reshare. Apologies Thanks. about that. No problem. So, are you seeing the title screen now? I am just seeing uh, text saying Paul Young has started screen sharing. Okay, I'll give it a moment and see if it <laughs> appears. No. Otherwise, I might ask one of my colleagues to share and see if they have any success. We've all learned to be patient with these kind of thinking issues. <laughs> Has it changed at all yet? Not for me. It's a, it's a good reminder that the technology is amazing, almost inconceivable in terms of where we were 10 years ago, and yet it still has its limitations. And I guess <laughs> the, same, the same is true of, uh, of AI. Yes. Um... I might see if one of my colleagues could share because I've had some internet con connectivity problems today. So it might be my internet, which is um, not. So if I don't know if Mark or Shanti, do you have the document up? I'll try to do. I'll try okay, to do I'll all. Stop sharing my screen. Okay, you stop sharing. I must have done 100 times. <laughs> so can you see my screen? Yes. yes, that looks more encouraging. OK, I'll try to see if it will let you present. Where are you? Um, 
I got to, I think, the la the data slide. Sorry for everyone, I've, um, we'll share the slides later if <laughs> you didn't get to see the slides. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, okay, have you finished this? Uh, I was just doing this and then it goes over to Mark's bit. Sure. Cool. Just let me okay. know when to change that slide. Cheers. Thanks, Shanti. Um, so, yes, as I was saying, the, um, the documents were a set of material um, created by the National Archives Records Management Team. So there were actual records which we were using. So they were categorized by retention schedules um, and it was very useful to have it, um, but it might not be that representative of a sort of data set which you would create yourself if you were doing this, as it might not represent all of the um, different categories. And it also definitely isn't what you would expect of a standard government department. We're expecting to, there to be much more unstructured data and sort of if you're building supervised training sets, then it might require a fair amount of work to get it to, uh, to be ready to train a model. Um, I think I can pass it, go to the next slide, Shanti, and then I'll pass over to Mark. Okay, thanks, Paul. I realise it probably would have been better for me to take over the sharing screen, but never mind. <laughs> Don't go through that again. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon. Good good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, with this with this project, with, there's a number of ways um, we can kind of evaluate the, the the project and the products we saw. Um, we have the kind of a, the the headline accuracy of the the machine learning. Um, but also the um, kind of where the, where the human in the loop side of it comes in. Where, how, how do we fit into, into the whole process? Um, we can also look at how you might iteratively improve a, a model. Um, and then the possibly one of the most important things, the cost side of things. Um, so there's lots of different ways of, of doing it. Um, but in the project itself, it was, it was, it was difficult. We were on time, tight time scales. We had limited kind of internal resource and um, we had five suppliers coming in showing five different tools um, all at the same time um, and our, our well our primary kind of expert on the records was actually upgrading to SharePoint at the time so he was very busy and um, so it's very difficult to do some of these things um, so probably a lot of what you'll see is actually on the machine learning side um, but we have thought about a lot of the, the, the other aspects. Um, next slide please. Shandy. Um, okay, so here is um, what I'm calling machine learning in a slide. Um, this is definitely a supervised um, learning uh, scenario. Um, so we take in uh, labeled training data. Um, we pass it through a, an algorithm, which um, is basically an optimization program that tries to um, find the best model that will map the input data to the, um, the expected outputs. Um, and then we also feed test data into that model um, as part of the process to assess how well um, we think it's doing. Um, and then out of the, um, the other side of the model, you get labels. Um, and then I can't actually see the right-hand side of my slides. So I'm gonna minimize that. Thing. Um, and then we want to um, evaluate um, what comes out of the thing. Oops, sorry. Um, and, um, and it's an iter iterative process. Um, so, um, out of the um, end of the uh, at the end of the machine learning algorithm, um, we will get um, some scores, some some kind of uh, uh, value at the other side, um, and that will using that we will make a decision: shall we um, keep the record or, um, or 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 throw it away? Um, so we can archive or not. Um, now, if we if we get that. Depending on where we, we set our, our threshold for deciding whether to archive something or not, um, will depend on how much we keep and how much we throw away. So we could potentially um, uh, delete records that we wanted to keep, and we could keep, but we could also keep far too many records. Um, now I've put this as a simple kind of seesaw balancing act of um, what what we should. Um, be keeping how, where we set our thresholds. But actually there's a lot of stakeholders involved in this decision. It's not just um, us as the archive, we have our users, we have um, different stakeholders within the archive. So I'd imagine if we decided to keep all of the records 
then the digital archiving team and the people who uh, manage the storage uh, might start complaining a lot. Um, similarly, our users might complain because they're being swamped with too much information to be able to pro sort of sift through and look through. Um, although having seen readers in the uh, in the record in, in the reading room, the archives that might not be the case. I think people are quite happy happily wading through an archive. Um, but more importantly, we could delete records. Um, a lot of records that we shouldn't, don't want to. So there's a definite risk balancing act. Um, and I think that's certainly something that has to be considered when using any um, machine learning archive, uh, algorithm. Uh, Chanting, next slide, please. We also get, out of the machine, we don't, we don't get a um, yes, no decision out of the, um, that might be how we interpret it, but we actually get um, usually a confidence. So in a, in a, binary classification task, you get a, um, you get a number, which might be, um, so if we take the, just one of these examples here, um, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 means that um, it is um, weighting 70% uh, confident that the value is, is, is A, um, and only 30% confidence on the, that we've got class, class B, whatever that means. Now, um, we set a, we set our kind of threshold. We may say, well, anything over fifty percent, we're going to take as A, and um, below fifty percent, we'll take as as B. Um, but if I if I tell you that um, I have a nice, accurate system, um, and if it's, but I, I I know that if it says A, then I'm ninety percent confident that it is right. Um, now that. That means I can trust that 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 um, result quite well, but if I'm only sixty percent confident that if it says it's A, it is actually A, then I'm I'm going to start saying, well, actually, it's told me a result, but I need to double check all those results. Um, so one of our suppliers actually did um, do some evaluation along these lines to say how much you could trust the confidence of the machine, um, and that's quite important as well because you can have machines um, being ninety nine nine point nine percent sure that um, of the classification, but they can still be quite quite wrong. Um, and so you have to be able to trust what it says um, and have a, a measure of how much you should trust it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, another side of kind of trying to compare, compare, uh, compare products was that they all use different amount of data. And, and when I get to um, the next slide and kind of explain, explain why, um, but generally with machine learning, the, the more data you put in um, to train it, the more different sort of various examples you put in, the better it can learn patterns. Um, so the more data you put in, the better the performance um, you can get out the other end. Um, but as Anthony pointed out, you know, when you're trying to label tens of thousands of records in order to train a machine learning algorithm, that's very, very expensive. So if you have an efficient way of labeling 100,000 um, records, it may be they actually don't need the machine learning in the first place. You've <laughs> you've kind of solved the problem. And we were lucky that we had 100,000 records, um, which were kind of nicely curated within our um, corporate record system. But that's certainly not the case. And if we were going to work with our records from 15 years ago, um, it might be a different picture. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this comes down to how we teach the machine in the first place. Um, so as I said, if you're, if you're able to label 100,000 records um, efficiently, that, that's great, but you're probably using a, um, on the, the image on the left is kind of representing a sort of um, a GUI based system where you have um, all your documents sort of appear in a nice um, grid in the, on the desktop and you can just go and click, click through um, and select the documents you want to keep. Um, now, that would be nice for tens, maybe hundreds of records. But if you're trying to um, select hundreds of thousands of records, that's going to take um, a very long time, become um, quite tedious and difficult. Um, the alternative approach is to have a kind of batch of data that you will just load into, um, into a training algorithm. Um, but you need other ways of being able to label that data, which might be more at the, at the folder level, or um, using kind of broad brush regular expressions to try and um, collect as much data as possible to be able to load in. Um, and the, the one on the left is very much sort of more human in the loop iterative method where you're slowly but surely building training data. 
Um, and the products were used, used different methods, used, used both of these approaches. Um, and it's, it's what, which one will fit into your workflow best, which one will fit with your data best is which is, is the one that you're going to prefer. Next slide. Oh, and that's, that's an example of iteration there, the last little square appearing there. <laughs> um, no, next slide as well. Um, so this is where I'm going to go back to this um, machine learning pipeline. Um, and you may need to um, do next slide a couple of times, Shanti, to, some circles should appear. Um, so where do we have people within this process? Um, can you do next slide, please, Shanti? Yeah. So, um, well, we have people curating the training data in the first place. Um, we need that human expertise, um, that people really know the records to identify um, good set, good training data. You know, it's, it's sort of garbage in, garbage out with uh, machine learning. So you have to um, use that expert knowledge to correctly curate um, good training data. Um, next. Um, similarly with the test data, we, we need a um, set of test data which is representative of the um, of, of the real world data um, and that will need to be kind of carefully created to make sure it's really testing what we want our model to do. Um, and then we have people in the evaluation side. Um, you know we have to we have to be able to understand the records where it's going wrong, what it's doing right. Um, again on that kind of trust side, how can we can we trust the results that are coming out? Um, I think one more. Um, and then potentially, I thought there's a dotted line. Um, this, uh, again, what Anthea was saying earlier is the um, the people doing creating the algorithm, doing the machine learning side, doing the, the data scientists. They they may not be in our organisation. They may maybe um, have never seen an archive before. They may be working in um, a, an external company. Um, but if that there are people involved in that, and they need to be kind of invested in the in the whole process, and invested in what what we're doing. Um, yep, next slide's fine. Um, and it's an iterative process. Um, and so we, um, you know, we take take some collect. So we we train our model. We start automating the thing. We check what comes out the other end, and we we update um, where things have gone wrong, and we retrain, and we keep going until our model gets better. Um, the problem with that is the the world. What we're what we're often archiving is is reflective of the world and the world is changing all the time so our um our training data did not contain the word covid um and yet the following year so it may have had something about elections in there um but if we applied our um the model we built in at the very very end of 2019 or beginning of 2020 to um the following year's collection it would have entirely missed the biggest event of the year um and that's a problem. So we have to con continually um, keep keep reevaluating and um, and keep putting that manual and human knowledge into model building. Next slide. Um, yeah, and this this slide just kind of kind of captures the um, the, the various co co uh, considerations around costs um, and the different uh, kind of products we we looked at. Um, some of them are a records management system with integrated machine learning into it um, but you may not you may not choose your records management system purely based on whether it does selection or not um, then there's a kind of machine learning pipeline that you build with cloud components and um, you need technical expertise of that but also they're not they're not designed for this this is what the ones we used were um, they were really just piecing together bits of machine learning but there's no there's no front end there's no um, is, there's no user interface, there's nothing, there's no kind of um, knowledge in there. There's a lot of kind of manual technical processing, um, but the, a bigger system similar to the, the kind of records management system versions needs to be built around the outside of the cloud components. Um, and, then, and then there's a kind of data science of, of the service model, um, which um, could be tempting. Um, but I think we had worries about um, kind of scalability. Um, if everyone used that model, um, could the service providers kind of um, provide that kind of more um, man kind of hands-on service rather than a kind of cloud-based um, system? Uh, I think next slide's Paul's. I think. 
Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, so the next couple of slides are just looking at some of the things, sort of, sort of talking points which we which we found throughout the project, but by no means exhaust, exhaustive. Um, so with the training data, we can't really exaggerate how much time this could take to um, create a representative training data. It, it requires a, a fair amount of work. Um, and if you're building it to, to sort of reflect your appraisal policy or selection decisions, then you have to make sure it's re representative and diverse enough to, to undertake that. Um, an issue which we had with National Archives as well, but you also have to ensure that it includes selected and not selected records. So when, when we're looking at things like this, we only on the National Archives, we have selected records in the end. So that's why we're looking at our own um, material. Um, it should also avoid duplicates. So you could have a lot of records which are duplicated inside it and that might um, skew, uh, say you had a hundred documents of the same um, record which were all marked as select, then that could skew the results. Um, and it's also important to document the process of, of how you're sort of doing the training set of data because that's going to be quite important in showing how the model um, is making its decisions. Uh, so could you move to the next slide, Shanti? Uh, and that sort of leads into this next point, but where a lot of these tools still have work to do is, um, is in how the results are understood and explained. Um, so you see on the right hand side there's a, a what's called a confusion matrix um, which is quite a common way to sort of display results but it's not always that interpretable to a wider audience. Um, you know, data scientists understand it um, but say you're trying to explain to the public how how the archive or how the decisions were made on what came into the archive it, it sort of might not suffice um, and and I think at least it's important for records management and archivists at least to have some understanding of how tools are make decisions and one of the ways which that could be done is is, is in the data which is going into these models if that's understood then that can help. That might even include archiving that data um, as a sort of record of, of how these things have been decided. And as Mark was saying, it's something which is going to be ever changing. Um, could you do the next slide, Shanti? Uh, so just to finish off, um, um, as Amphia mentioned in her um, presentation, uh, we don't think that AI is going to replace records managers or archivists. That expertise is is needed to get the best out of any AI or ML solution. And that needs to be input. Uh, it's more useful in using it as a tool to reduce the scale of, of selection so that that expertise can be applied um, uh, over larger scales of documents. Um, it's a developing market, so there's still many issues around a lot of these tools and lots of things to consider, but a lot of these are very new products, um, so it's a good time to be involved in the requirements behind them. Um, machine learning is all about the data, as we've sort of been saying. Uh, whatever is going in to train or, or influence these things is going to be, it's going to influence how accurate or useful the output is going to be. Um, and you have to understand your risk appetite as going into these, as Mark was explaining, in terms of where your um, thresholds are going to be in, in terms of are you happy that some things might be missed or but you or are you happy that you'll have a, a lot of material, but um, you you might have a lot of ephemera, but you'll definitely have a, a good selection of the historically relevant material. Um, and it's also uh, being aware of the resourcing needs, and this will vary by, organ by your organizations. Um, generally, the te technical expertise is needed somewhere. It's either provided from an external supplier or it's coming from in-house. Um, generally, for a lot of these tools, it's, it's, it's probably off-the-shelf ones. It would be coming from the um, supplier themselves, but it's being aware of where that is is needed. 
And just as a final point, um, it's, it's important to um, share um, experiences so that archives can learn from each other as, as we sort of look at these solutions. Um, just as a, a final bit, uh, we've developed a report um, which was mainly to, uh, aimed at um, uh, UK government records managers um, as guidance behind them, but it's it's hopefully would be useful to a wider audience as well. Um, and we've also written a journal paper called Alexa, is this a historical record, which also looks at um, some of the issues we've discussed today and goes a bit further. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Don't we have a question slide, but I don't know if we're doing questions now. <laughs> Paul, Max, Shanti, uh, because you're not joining us on, on the panel, uh, I think we will uh, open up to see if there's any questions specifically about the, the presentation that you brought forward. So uh, uh, if there are people who want to put their hands up or just or pop a, uh, a question in the chat, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on those two, two options. I have one quick question for you. Uh, this on the cost piece. You're, what sort of order of magnitude uh, are the, the the sort of the hard dollar costs around the the products? So you're looking at commercially available uh, existing pieces. And where where are we at on the on the cost uh, uh, cycle for for these sorts of pieces? Recognizing that the bulk of the costs you highlighted are more around the the internal time and the training and, and all that stuff. But what's the what's the market like? I don't know if you're able to talk about this, Mark, a bit in terms of um, the pipeline. Um... Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know the the kind of the licensing costs of the the sort of more desktop tools, the ones which were like record management systems. Um, but um, the on the machine learning side of it. it it so much depends on the on on the pipeline, the type of data you're working with, um, the uh, I suppose the 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 power you need, the, the speed of, <laughs> of of movement, how much data you're working through. Um, but um, I mean, for example, we saw one supplier had. Um, I think the ones who talked about costs the most were the ones who were using cloud because the cloud they were using external cloud suppliers and so they were paying they were paying for it so they had to, they were very aware of their costs um and sometimes it depends on the services you're using so one one supplier used ocr i think there's some pdf documents in there and they used ocr to try and read the documents but they quickly found that that was actually costing quite a lot of money that uh, cloud-based ocr system so then they had to add an extra step in to really filter make sure there was a filter to make sure the only things that went down the OCR pipeline were definitely um, OCRable. Um, if they wanted to do sort of large um, kind of parallel processing, then you use more machines. And so that kind of covers your costs. So um, it's all, the thing with cloud is it's all, um, it's very transparent. You can, there's calculators, you can get down to the you know, hundredth of a, of a penny um, in terms of protect predicting costs but there's lots of extra little services that that all add up um and yeah every every second counts <laughs> every cpu counts um so i i think i think there's a there's there's more to do on that and i think refining refining the pipeline so you're you're as efficient as you can be processing your data would be really important thanks mark so we've got a question in the in the chat Noting that the uh, the appraisal that you described was very much done on unstructured data on also document uh, domains, and asking whether you also did anything to analyze data in business systems, and perhaps I guess if you have any observations about how the 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 method or the the findings might be different in that kind of more more structured data context. Anyone yeah, want to to comment on the, the differences there? <laughs> I think I can answer this question. Hi, I'm Shantilata, by the way. Uh, this is uh, uh, the documents that we have got or uh, the documents we have used to run this uh, project are the internal documents of the TNA itself. So uh, it is uh, structured in the way the metadata is structured quite, uh, quite neatly by our record managers and 
structured, but nevertheless, the content itself is unstructured. So uh, we got the metadata uh, supplied along with the unstructured data. And uh, if you want to know that uh, analyzing the data in business systems, it is more relevant to the area of business that we are handling. So uh, because each of these business systems, they have got their own interests uh, appropriate data that is interest we are interested in so we can extract only that particular information as a to structure the document i hope this helps thanks Shanti. any other questions for the for the tna team before we uh, move to the panel Hearing none, Mark, Paul, Fanti, thanks very much for that. I think really great to see that we're already at a point where this stuff is not just sort of hypothetical and, and future, but the, you can already build testbed pipelines and, uh, and and actually kind of kick the tires and start to, to see some of the, the challenges in the real world. So I think that kind of actually, um, the experience of doing that is, is, I think, really important for us all as, as archivists to see that this is this is not just a coming in ten years thing. This is these are uh, techniques and uh, and products that are that are already in deployment, whether they're embedded in some of the records management tools or kind of connect, uh, integrated through a uh, through an archival uh, institution. But that. Uh, uh, courage of actually trying to, to stand some of these things up and, and, and play with them, I think, is, is to be applauded and, and uh, will give some real insights to the, to the, to the broader community. Um, hopefully you're sticking around for the rest of the session. And if you want to, if there's any sort of comments that you, you find you want to make based on, on your uh, project as we uh, go through the other uh, the rest of the, the panel discussion, please feel free to, uh, to, to contribute. But um, uh, thanks again, certainly. Looking forward to having a, a read of the, the journal article. So with that, I'll uh, uh, introduce uh, Jenny Bunn and uh, Giovanni Colavizza, who are joining us for the, the panel discussion to try and, I guess, make a little bit of sense of this and, and again, set some more foundations for the, the conversations over the next couple of days. So I've already introduced Anthea, who's also uh, uh, part of the session, but uh, Jenny Bunn uh, is uh, uh, an academic teaching uh, archives and records management at University College London, where she's completed her PhD uh, after uh, a, a a career in multiple kinds of institutions in the commercial museum and, and uh, also like like most UK colleagues, it seems a, a stint at, uh, at TNA. Uh, and uh, certainly Jenny is uh, familiar to many of us as a, as a presenter on a range of uh, archives and records uh, topics. Uh, I think her PhD was on archival description rather than selection, but uh, we all know how interconnected these things are. Uh, and secondly, Giovanni Kolovica is uh, an assistant prof at University of Amsterdam in, in the Netherlands, uh, where his research focuses on uh, using data to study cultural and social phenomena. So uh, coming from a, a, a data perspective, uh, and also, uh, I know Giovanni, you've uh, done quite a bit of work around the applications of machine learning uh, on uh, cultural workflows and the like. So again, uh, uh, thank you for, for joining and, and sharing your, uh, your insights. So the, the question that we, or the badge that we put on this panel session, uh, uh, I guess was quite blunt, you know, can AI be used for archival uh, selection and appraisal. So if all three of you turn around and say no, then I guess we go home, <laughs> cancel the next two days of, of discussion um, and, and, and decide that uh, despite the hype, there's, there's nothing to see here. I mean, I've, I've got a sense from Anthea that she thinks the answer is probably yes, but um, uh, Jenny and, and, and Giovanni, can uh, can you say, so is, is, is there a role for AI and perhaps more usefully, what does it look like? What 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 are the use cases or the uh, the low hanging fruit at this point? We'll perhaps then look at where where the stuff might go in the longer term. But um, uh, if I can start with you, Giovanni, and then uh, then we'll turn to Jenny. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the for your invitation and to to good day to all of you um, uh, here. Um, and also, uh, um, thank you for the previous speakers. Uh, it was really uh, really interesting to uh, to follow along and learn more about their perspectives and work. Um, so while I, I think I'm not allowed to say no, so I will say yes, definitely uh, AI can be can be used for for appraisal. Um, I think so very much, and um, but right. So but I think there are challenges, right? And, and we have we have seen already uh, some of that, and probably see more in the coming days. Um, I think appraisal is perhaps one of the most challenging steps uh, whereby AI could be used in the context of uh, archives because it's it's really uh, intimately connected to the function of, of archivists and archives, whereby it entails a decision that is very substantive and very important and then core to what the collection is going to be uh, afterwards uh, in the archive and then how users will be able to, to access it, but also most importantly, what they will be able to access. Uh, so um, I'd like to start by saying that I think from what I have seen in my work and in collaborating with archives that uh, AI is being used a little bit more at the moment for uh, not easier, but uh, let's say a little bit more straightforward uh, applications such as, for example, the organization of archives and providing search functionalities, providing different means for accessing archives to users. Uh, whereby instead appraisal is, I think, quite uh, still quite the challenge. And in, in my opinion, uh, maybe the main reason is not as much purely technical, but it has to do with the necessary um, interoperability and collaboration between humans and the AI. Uh, that uh, that come in play there, and I think we have seen uh, this point made by both uh, previous presenters. So I think definitely possible, but very challenging because humans need to be absolutely in the loop. And in my opinion, we are uh, still to uh, we are still figuring out exactly how to do that, technically, but also from a human perspective. So what I mean here is more about designing workflows, designing interfaces, designing means for archivists to be able to uh, rely on the AI, uh, but not be out of the loop, be very much into the loop. So this I think is the, the big challenge that I see and happy to, to discuss more about it. Thanks. I will definitely come back to, to some of those, uh, those points. Jenny, can we use AI in this space? Uh, yes, but again, with provisos and buts and things, and I, mean, I think, to build from what Giovanni was saying, I think that we do have to put this in context because obviously we're archivists and if we put this in context, it's not about AI. And I, I am getting quite frustrated sometimes by the fact that it's all the conversation is about AI and a, AI is many, many things. And quite often when people are talking about AI, they're talking about a very specific form of machine learning as Anthea was pointing out. And more than that, they're, they're talking about a specific application of machine learning. And that is to sort of do this kind of binary classification or that kind of classification or predictive kind of work um, of labels. And so I think that, that we do have to be careful that AI is more than that. So I think if you do that, you begin to see that we have got history here and it goes back a lot further than you think. I mean, in 1995, and Gilliland did doctoral research on an expert assistant for archival appraisal. And that's kind of quite often where, if you see any of the reviews of kind of archival work around sort of born digital appraisal, they kind of point back to that reference point in 1995. And that sort of points to the fact that AI doesn't just have to be machine learning. You know, before machine learning, another big thing in AI for a period was kind of this idea of expert systems, which was kind of encoding the rules that are the archivists kind of used to sort of help, you know, encoding those rules so that those rules could be applied by a machine to some extent. So there is this idea of expert systems and that was explored as far back as 1995 in, in kind of archival um, circles. I mean, I think it's interesting because ultimately what you find is that if you ask the experts to articulate the rules on which they work, they're all different and everybody says something different so it's it's not I'm not saying it's not challenging but I think that sort of points to it and again I think the point about workflow and interfaces we've been doing this to some extent yeah paradigm project which was a UK-based project to look at kind of how to deal with 
born digital material of politicians, but it kind of had a whole section in sort of 2005, 2007, that's when the project was going on about born digital appraisal and how do we sort of select and transfer born digital material. And it was talking about using tools like um, something called Karen's directory printer, which was there at the time, I think it's still there, but that was just about kind of extracting the metadata. So how do we help the archivist undertake born digital appraisal? Well, we take advantage of the fact that there is metadata perhaps and we extract it and we then present that metadata to the archivist to give them an overview, a sense of it. And this kind of idea of kind of what is the approach that we're taking um, to born digital appraisal and there is it is this very much a kind of workflow and also a kind of um, sort of decision support kind of mechanism whereby we're using tools to help give us an overview and they might be things like Karen's directory printer or next iteration perhaps they might be things like droid which TNA developed back about that time yeah because that gives you kind of an overview it gives you a sort of list of the material that you can kind of begin to sort of make a decision about and then that sort of those tools get kind of incorporated into workflows um, so you get like articles like Victoria Sloyan who wrote about a kind of workflow that they developed at the welcome to do this sort of um, work and that was about 2016 so again not not you know it, it, it's, it's recent and things like bit curator and epad these are systems that were being built and that still exist that kind of help us with this workflow you know we, we, we're devising a workflow for this so i think a lot of what we need to think about is that it's not it's not about ai <laughs> It's about this kind of workflow and exactly this. It's about getting the system and the interface and like that, that, how do we do that um, together? So I think that's very important, but there is AI in that. And I think this goes to Anthea's point that she made earlier about what people want is, um, you know, they want the kind of automation play. They want that kind of benefit. So where you are seeing AI perhaps already in these systems is where it can, we can make kind of make use of those kind of, pre-trained or the things that are things that are already out there so natural language processing that is a big thing so as Anthea has pointed out as others have pointed out the metadata can be wrong or the metadata can be confusing um, or the metadata can be you know not very reflective of what's in it so if you're using things like named language natural language processing such that you're doing named entity recognition um, on your contents of your documents, you've got the opportunity then of kind of flagging it up, perhaps, you know, so if the name entity recognition is pulling out dates that have nothing to do with the date that is kind of there, then maybe you flag it up for somebody to look at, things like that. So that kind of stuff is in there. But what I think we haven't got, sorry, just to finish, is that this sort of machine learning classification, so this kind of machine learning. So this idea that we are going to be able to kind of train a model that we're then going to be able to deploy such that we throw all our stuff into the model and it comes out the other end, keep, not keep, keep, not keep. That's not here, nor will it necessarily ever be here, nor do we ever necessarily want it to be here. So I think that's the question. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Anthea, I think, again, to, the, to you, the, the black and white, can we? And uh, and I guess the, uh, the if so, where? Is it that the... the the keep destroy is it as Jenny's suggesting some of more of the uh, the decision support pieces? Uh, uh, is it uh, uh, is it somewhere else in the ecosystem? And uh, with all the different flavors that we have in AI, where where should we be focusing in terms of the 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 best early use cases? Um, so I think I I agree with what a lot of people are saying, which is we we need it. I think my caveat would be that we need it now. I think that there's some, the amount of information that we're going to end up dealing with, I'm not sure when the workflows are gonna kick in. Like this is, this is the sort of challenge that we're facing right now around the application of AI and appraisal and selection is that there's a need now. So there was a need when I was at National Archives and now it's been like five or six years because our government departments are having to tackle this question of, I need to transfer my records, but, and the reason we started applying machine learning and looking at it is because it was becoming a blocker. It was becoming a blocker to transfer, and it was essentially impeding not only the government department's responsibility, and I'm talking here in a UK context, but I think that there are many use cases if, if we start really sort of plumbing this particular question where people are not willing to transfer their records because they don't know what's in it and they can't identify what's in it. And then you get into issues of how do I, I can't transfer my records because I haven't been able to identify for us the one of the, the, 
the impetus is behind the research was sensitivity. And it can be a blocker because what they may end up doing is actually transferring, but transferring closed or not making an appraisal and selection decision and just handing you a bunch of stuff, which brings its, its own set of issues. So I think there's a real question for the community about how do we deal with the problem we have now, but then look at the workflows and the microservices that need to be in place to automate it. Will there ever be a keep destroy? No. What I think what we're going to get is a, a flavor of, you know, this is depending on what parameters we have may have in place in that workflow. This material is 80% relevant. This material is 5% 5, 5 relevant. And it will be the reasoning and the weighting that sits behind whatever algorithm we do end up developing as a community with being mindful of the fact that the machine will never be 100%. I think I would prefer to move to some type of reinforcement Bayesian model that looks at risk, picking up on some of the work that TNA has already done in diagram, which was around uh, a measuring uh, preservation risk. And I think that's sort of, I think we're going more towards a risk model of, if you don't keep this, there's a high risk that it, it, you'll, you'll, lose, you'll lose historical information, valid, important historical information. But also then it's understanding of, you can't keep everything. So you're, make, you're still making decisions, but it's that transparency of the decision-making. And we also as a community need to mitigate both the IT and the historians that are telling us that we need to keep everything which is just at this point in time is not feasible. I think Paul and Mark very rightly pointed out that cloud is not free. And if you think there's gonna be a government or an organization that's gonna allow you to stick your stuff in the cloud and let researchers access it and parse through it using cloud services and is gonna dedicate the amount of money to do that, it's never gonna happen. And it's gonna cause a lot of issues for archives to be able to continue to make accessible uh, records. So appraisal and selection is still very much valid in this context, but we need to be mindful of the risks that are involved, our influ the decision making that we're making, uh, and all of these types of issues. Yeah. It's, so you, you touched there quite a lot on the importance of transparency, and I think both Jenny and, and Giovanni kind of mentioned that as well. How, do, how are we accountable for the decisions that we take, the transparency, uh, and the risks that go along with kind of leaning into some of these black box technologies? So um, I'm just interested if people have any thoughts about, yeah, how do, we, how do we really kind of continue to progress the idea of transparency and explainability uh, in our professional decision making? Uh, whilst also getting uh, value out of the the opportunities from from AI, which in many cases are uh, even in their sort of natural home grounds being challenged because of the, they're not easily explainable or understandable by the folk that even kind of create those services. So that tension between our professional desire for accountability, explainability, and transparency, and uh, the the difficulties of of that is it around simply being really transparent about where and how we're using these tools and some of those ideas that uh, uh, Mark and Paul talked about around explaining how we're training the algorithms and kind of trying to be accountable for the steps that we are taking. But anybody got thoughts on this, this sort of concept of accountable use of, uh, uh, of AI in our decision making? Can I just chime in on that quickly? So I completely agree with, with Paul and, and Mark. First, it's how we train, but it's I think there's also the other element of how do we then interrogate the system once it's trained, right? And that's what we were trying to develop. We were trying to develop that process when I was at National Archives, because I was conscious and my team that I was working with in digital transfer were conscious that you know, we're making decisions using imperfect systems, like we were doing using off the shelf commercial e-discovery software and data analytics. And so what we would try and do is, is capture the searches that we were doing, is capture the types of keywords that we were using. It's not elegant, it's not pretty, it's not perfect, but it was a first step to try and get a sense of what does this accountability look like for us? I mean, I think there's a lot there and I think the trouble is as soon as I get starting about accountability it all gets a bit muddled in my head because there's like so many layers to it for archivists so you know one thing is if governments start to use algorithms to make decisions then how do we keep a record of that what is the public record with regard to that that's a whole question in itself right that I don't think we've answered 
um, put that one side. Then there's the kind of, you know, perhaps easier question to some extent. If we use machine learning or we use algorithms in our own decision making, then isn't it kind of um, quite important that we should perhaps put our money where our mouth is and be accountable for that and think about that. But at least we've got slightly more control over that um you know as anthea says you know we, we we at least we're aware of the issue and we can think think it through i mean it's not easy and we don't we don't have any easy answers but at least we're aware of it um i mean and of course then all of that's happening in a context where society is becoming aware of this issue as well and you're getting all of these kind of codes of conducts and ethics and um, there's a new kind of algorithmic transparency standard that has been kind of um, piloted within the UK recently, which is supposed to be documenting kind of it's a sort of um, things to document or things, you know, that it's going to be published. So if you're using an algorithm, particularly in one of those kind of high impact kind of um, places, you have to kind of document it in this way or at least record metadata about it so that if somebody's in, you know, so people know that you're using it and that they can find out more about it, that sort of question. So there are there is all this kind of going on. And I think it's really, really difficult. But I think, you know, some things that we can perhaps do is just have more conversations and kind of this question of risk and the Bayesian kind of risk analysis and the diagram tool. What you have to be able to do that is you have to kind of um, come to some sort of community consensus on that so I think I think having the discussions about what I mean obviously it's good everybody's going to have their own risk appetite right but at least being open about that and thinking about the variables could be quite an interesting thing to do and if you've got time if we've got time today I can sort of um go dive into the detail if you like of some of the results that were given by the product one of the products that Mark talked about and um, that was used in the AI and I can give you the kind of way it was presented to us and we can then ask the question together, you know, which one, which model is good enough, which is the best and which do we think would be good enough. So we could do that as an experiment if we wanted to just here, but I leave that for later if we've got time. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so, well, uh, briefly, uh, and really just to double down on what is being said in particular by, by Jenny, I, I fully, I fully agree. I would really uh, take the need for accountability in, in the use of AI as an opportunity for the community of archivists to make a contribution that can lead to a, a much broader uh, impact even beyond um, archives because this is very much needed uh, much more broadly speaking um, in terms of standards and guidelines that are uh, publicly acceptable uh, in order to uh, to make ai decisions accountable and i think in this respect uh, Again, technically, if I can uh, contribute with that perspective, some steps have been made. Um, for example, uh, John, you mentioned explainable AI, right? So this is this is a thriving area of research, uh, and uh, which I, I believe it's extremely interesting, and it can help in uh, providing a, a human understandable uh, explanation for a certain AI decision, for example, classification decision or or, or otherwise, um, but also creating metadata about confidence of certain decisions uh, or otherwise what was used to train a certain algorithm in terms of, uh, of ground truth data, so-called. Uh, so I think all this can be done technically, uh, but it is the connection, I believe, with uh, the, the, the technicalities and what the community uh, thinks is appropriate to have as a standard. So the consolidation of those conversations that, that Jenny was mentioning into standards and guidelines that I think is uh, an important step uh, step forward at the moment. Thanks. Uh, listening to you, you talking, I I have a little bit of a, a fear that you know, if one of the weaknesses we have is that our decision making as human professional archivists is inconsistent, is is not as uh, as rigorous or as transparent or inexplainable for that matter uh, as we would like it to be. So uh, I wonder if we're criticizing AI for the shortcomings that actually are, are already present uh, in our own practices. And where I go with that is, is there an opportunity for uh, the use of machine learning, uh, various AI applications to actually serve as a challenge function for us in our own existing professional practices and highlight uh, in a constructive way uh, opportunities for us to, 
to improve the the codification, the articulation of risk. I mean, the uh, the distinction between talking about um, uh, appraisal in very generic terms as a as a risk based cost benefit type piece and the the ability to demonstrate that in any individual scenario of selection and uh, and appraisal feels to me like we've got a, a bit of a gap but any any thoughts about about yeah, how how ai can actually help us improve human based based practice by by showcasing the inconsistencies Maybe very, very quickly again, uh, just uh, technically, I think this is a very, a very neat idea. And uh, for what I see it is happening, for example, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a private sector and, and uh, perhaps uh, it can happen uh, even more uh, in, the, um, in the context of archives in the future. But um, I think AI can definitely be used for that. And it's, uh, it's very exciting actually, because uh, if we take what we normally call ground truth, right? So human, human annotated data that is used to train an AI. Um, well, we can assume that that's correct and then, and then move forward. But uh, we know very well now that that's uh, often not the case. Um, for example, because there are all sorts of biases that can go into, into uh, training data. Now, to your uh, question, John, I think, um, uh, if we train an AI with certain data, then we can inspect the AI, so use techniques from explainable AI, for example, in order to understand what are uh, inconsistency, what are uh, decision areas where the AI is particularly uh, unsure about or not consistent about, as a means to see whether there are inconsistency in the data itself to begin with, and then possibly biases and possibly other issues that come not from the AI, but from elsewhere. So technically, I think this is an underexplored area that has quite a bit of promise. Yeah, and I'd agree absolutely there's a double standard, but you know, that's 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 your point. You know, AI is already offering the challenge that you ask, right? Because we've recognized the double standard. So it's already doing that. And I think that you can look at some of the other things around accountability and that kind of transparency thing. So the AI community, um, are developing their own forms of documentation to kind of record the data sets. So they're aware now, obviously, as we all are, that you know what you train your algorithm on or what you train your model on will impact. So you, the quality of the data counts, right? It's important. So they're creating things like data sheets. They're creating things taking from like food safety labels. They have these data nutrition labels, which are quite amusing that kind of give health warnings on data sets and say, you know, don't use it for this because it's not going to be helpful for this and that sort of thing. And it's quite interesting. So for example, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is I'm trying to write, use that model and take that model and write it as for an archive. So if we see an archive as a data set and you try and kind of provide those kind of health warnings it's horrific really if you think about it the number of health warnings we need to put on our data about it, its incompleteness its biasness all of this it, it's there um, and I think it's quite interesting to do it the other way so I don't think we can all just it's not just all going one way I think actually you're right it does offer a challenge and one way in which we can recognize that challenge is to actually look what's going on over there and try and kind of apply it to sort of challenge our assumptions so Yes, we can argue that an archive is not a data set. Yes, I agree. But it's it's interesting to kind of play with those boundaries and to see the different ways in which you can see it. So that's another thing that's quite fun. So if you want to look up data nutrition labels and then try and write a data nutrition label for your archive and see how far you get before you go mad. I love that idea. I've got to say, Jenny, I think that's, that, is, that is such a cool use of a practice from the, the AI data world to to think about our own uh, 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 practices uh, and you again kind of confront potentially the shortcomings uh, in them. You know, we we are very quick to talk about the integrity, authenticity, neutrality of the archive, and you you particularly after a couple of years, we all bemoan the fact how uh, how that's not the case. So nice idea to use some of those those real life practices to to highlight that. Anthea, you're going to chip in on this thing. So yeah, I would say I agree with, with Giovanni that we can use the data to identify, you know, inconsistencies to begin to question. But I think picking up on Jenny's point is that our data is inherently inconsistent that we're dealing with. And I think too, we need to recognize the limitations of the machine, that the machine 
and especially the ones that we will be using, these are not, and even in deep neural networks, they can only consider so many alpha, so many variables. And the thing is, is that the human needs to be there because we have a much bigger overview of the overall situation. Um, and I think that, and you, you see this when you talk about bias, you know, issues around data and biased algorithms that are developed is that the algorithms are looking at this much you know, of the overall problem. And so I think it's about how do we both use the tools to either explain the issues in the data that we are dealing with and the inconsistencies of the data that we may be dealing with, as well as inform our own practice and make our practice more transparent. Because my concern, we start saying, you know, using AI as, as sort of a, a litmus test to transparency and accountability, it's that there are already sort of there are limitations into what into what these machines can do and i think we need to look beyond the machine itself as well when we talk about accountability and transparency and not use the output as the sort of uh means of justifying a decision because i think we can easily go down that road when we talk about uh looking at accountability and transparency in our practice using machines back you wanted to chip in on this thread Um, yeah, just a couple of thoughts on the um, kind of the, the the inconsistencies and the, the ambiguities you might get in the in the in the training data that goes in, um, and whether we can whether we can capture as well as the decision of label label one or label two, the why the human thinks it's label one, um, and how you feed that in, um, not necessarily into the into the training, but into the evaluation to see if the machine is making the decision based on the same features that perhaps the, the human is doing. Um, so that might be one kind of thing that we could do um, to see if it's applying the same thought, pro not thought process, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, and my other thought was on, oh, I can't remember what I thought I was thinking about now. I might come back to you again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the other thing I'd like to kind of connect it back to. So when we're talking about the kind of data and the data is biased, et cetera, I think we should also not forget we've had this conversation before <laughs> to some extent when we had all that discussion around what do we do with case files and should they be sampled and what is a fair sample? And, or, you know, if we're going to sort of use these case files for kind of statistical kind of data analysis about, you know, cases, then... You know, so I think we, we shouldn't forget that we have kind of had this conversation and perhaps we could revisit that, at least look back, see what we decided last time um, and do that. So I think that there are things like that, that, that kind of, again, this is this kind of putting it in context. AI is, AI is sexy, AI is exciting, AI is the future, right? But, but our appraisal and selection has got a longer history than that. And we, we have thought through some of these issues. And then I, I would also sort of point to Mark's point about kind of how is the decision how is the decision being made and there are limits as we know with sort of explaining a black box but I think that there are kind of areas where we can peek, peek into that box a bit more and one of them is around feature engineering and the kind of way in which the features are kind of being engineered because to some extent it's those features that are kind of being being sort of fed into the machine and from which the machine's learning. So I think we can look at some of those, those kind of things. So, you know, if it is just on the content or is it on the content and a combination of the metadata that something's being decided or the title or, you know, those kind of thinking of through the features, I think is quite important. Um, and I know that archivists possibly don't want to be engineers, but I'd much rather engineer my own document so that the features that I think are going to be most useful might be get fed in rather than the ones that I think are going to be less useful. Point. Shades of the uh, significant features uh, discussion from digital uh, pre preservation uh, a while back in terms of identifying what we need to know about and then engineering the presence of those features to enable better decision making. Is that, is that what you were thinking? Yes and not. Yes and no. I mean, significant features is a different conversation because significant features is what do we need to preserve, right? So what do, yeah. what do we care about? What do we want to keep? What do we want to preserve in that sense? Um, whereas I think features is this is more kind of how do we how do we represent our material in numbers or vectors or something and, and and that's a form of representation so there's a kind of element of representation that's being put in and it's being representation in a form that is completely alien to me at least I'm, I mean not everybody but I, I mean once it's in that form it, it's meaningless as far as I'm concerned but it's kind of how can I convey what 
my meaning into that kind of representation? Is there a way I can work with the people who know about making these formats and forms of representation or representing things in this way? Is there a way I can work with the, those people who know about that to kind of try and have a conversation about what what what's important to me and, and whether that can be captured in that representation in some way? Right. Thanks for the clarification. So just building on that, um, Ian, I'm, I'm starting to think here about the difference between uh, selection based on analysis of content and selection based more on analysis of context. And Anthea, you, you noted that that kind of context inferencing is, is really hard for, for machines, especially if it, it is uh, implicit rather than, than, than explicit. And Jenny, as you say, you know, do we need to make more of those, those features, particularly around some of the, the context that we have highlighted in our professional practices explicit through, through metadata or, or other, uh, other representational tools? Or do we need to actually take a step back and say that we have underestimated the, the utility of content analysis because it wasn't scalable? Uh, and again, to the, the points that a number of folk have made about the, the, the what AI and indeed computing does really well is repeatable, consistent scaling uh, of a practice. So uh, should we be looking back at our, our professional the privilege that we put on context over, over content in a different light because of the, the different tools now available to process uh, content at scale? So I think that context is the, I would say the extraneous variable that it would be extremely difficult to capture in an AI system because it's, multi, it's a multifaceted variable. So I think it's how do you balance that which sits outside of the machine with that which sits in the machine. And this is where it's sort of, because my experience looking at context to understand the data it was very much what we traditionally kind of did as archivists and it's maybe it's a bit ephemeral, but it's that uh, one set of records where we were trying to develop the tags to be able to look at the data. We actually had to go and interview people that had left the organization to get an understanding, to begin to get an understanding of the content of the, of the actual data set. So we, we not only interviewed the people that were uh, the records managers, information managers within the organization about that particular time period that we were looking at, but then we had to go fill the gaps in their knowledge with people that had left the organization, either retired or moved on to be able to get a better sense of how do you start to construct the, we were looking at very basic sort of keyword terms and dates, uh, date expressions, for interrogating those records, um, so I think it's 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 a bit of it's a bit of both. It's it's it, and I don't know that there's going to be any type of machine that at this point anyway that's going to be able to solve that. And so I think it's it's a balance of context that may sit outside the machine and the content. And I don't think you can you can break those two things apart. I think that they are they are reliant on each other. Again, as soon as you start talking about context, I get in a muddle because um, context is everything as far as I'm concerned. But um, I, mean, I think there is an element, of, the way I kind of see it that gives me some clarity is, it, is, is, the, is the machine is learning. So the machine is developing its own model of the world and the machine can develop its own model of the world only on the basis of what it's given <laughs> to some extent. So if you're giving it... Um, if you're giving it a set of documents, a corpus to uh, analyze, ultimately it's gonna come up with the model of the world that is only encompassed within those documents and nothing beyond it to some extent, yeah. So that's, that's the difference for me. Whereas if you're kind of giving it extra information perhaps, then it might learn, it, it might be able to develop a more sophisticated model of the world perhaps, yeah, on which to base things, I don't know, but I find it, I also struggle because that's when I start getting confused and that's when I start getting into RIC and linked data and that's when I start getting into ontologies and that's when I get into this idea that we can perhaps encode our knowledge of the world and we can use that encoded knowledge of the world alongside perhaps some of this more sophisticated content analysis to kind of do some of that inference which you know perhaps isn't there yet but there's the potential perhaps for that and can can we kind of do that so I think that for me is also kind of 
connecting with the archival description. That's where we get into the archival description. And, and also that kind of idea of context for me is kind of the working of the organization. And, and we are now getting kind of systems in business systems that are kind of creating knowledge graphs of that organization based on the kind of, you know, some kind of AI machine learning based on analyzing the content and the connections and the people who are speaking to each other and the emails. And if, if, if we're getting machines or business systems that can kind of develop those knowledge graphs of the working of an organization, to me, that is to some extent context. To me, that to some extent provenance to some extent and and can we harness that and bring that into the archive as well um, and use that knowledge graph that knowledge that a machine has built but based on its observation of the working of that organization can we utilize that knowledge in our own appraisal or in appraisal and selection so I think that's perhaps that's why my mind starts to get a bit blown but I think that that's there somewhere and I mean, if Giovanni could tell me if I'm just misunderstanding the whole way it works, that'd be great. But that's my understanding in kind of very simple terms. But I think, too, we need to distinguish about what is accessible to the archivists on this call. Like what we're talking about is well-resourced, huge organizations, whereas what we did when I was at TNA was like it was cheap and cheerful and we had off the shelf. So I think what we're talking about for me is something like that we can perhaps look at for a future, but I'm what I'm trying to talk about for me is what what can colleagues who may be on this call and don't have a lot of money uh, can do to build that context because the machines they're going to be using off the shelf are going to be pretty basic in terms of functionality. Sorry, Giovanni, I'll cut you off there. No, not at all. This this is a great point, and uh, yeah, yet again, technical perspective. I think Jenny, you have you have a pretty solid understanding of how it works, actually. So uh, I think, well, to the machine, to some extent, everything is content or, or uh, it's an association between content, right? So what I mean with that is that we can definitely model uh, or include part of the context from an archival point of view to the extent that that can be data as well, right? So then therefore it can also be part of the input, but not necessarily the part of the input whereby a decision is made upon, right? So not the record to keep, but relevant data in order to inform the decision on what on which records to keep so this is absolutely possible it can take the form of, of unstructured data or even better knowledge graphs or anything in between such as for web archives uh, so i think i think that that is definitely possible but i would still say that the the, the relevant let's say context uh, from an archival perspective at, at the moment uh, and possibly also in the future can only be manifested by the archivist decision uh, in terms of keeping or not. And that for the machine becomes an association, right? So that, that's, that's in the ground truth, right? So that's a yes and no or any more elaborated uh, decision that is made. Um, and then what is learned is an association between uh, input and output, so to say. So in there, there is a lot of context, but it's a bit latent. It's not necessarily data, input data. Uh, so in theory, definitely possible. In practice, uh, I think, yeah, it, it, it depends what, it's, what is the situation. Situation can, be, can, can vary widely. Um, for example, I mentioned web archives. In there, there is an abundance of data. There is an abundance of context in the sense that I mentioned. So why not using it uh, for making an appraisal decision? In other situations, probably that the data... Uh, is much uh, more scarce or the resources are much more scarce so focusing on the, on the content itself is already uh, a good start I would say. Thank you. Now I'm just going to take this in a slightly different direction I mean, we, we have uh, two folk from universities uh, on the panel and Anthea you've been very prominent <laughs> over time in giving uh, talks and webinars in kind of the educational space so I'm, I'm interested in any thoughts about how do we educate the archivists of tomorrow to, to take this conversation forward and to, to really uh, build it. To what extent is, uh, are these questions that we're discussing today already a core part of the uh, archives curricula? Uh, and if not, how, how do we ensure that we are, uh, we're building a workforce that is well equipped to uh, 
to make the best possible use of advancing uh, AI in all its multiple forms and, uh, uh, and variants as we go forward. And I think that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I think that, um, I, you know, I have friends who work uh, in, in information studies programs all over the world. And I think it's the challenge is actually building that into the curriculum. You know, I think that at this point, as far as I'm aware, Jenny, I'm looking to you because you're, you know, you were at UCL um, for a long time. And I know you were looking at some of this. Uh, around how do we how do we how do we begin to train archivists to be able to use these types of tools, maybe not necessarily machine learning, but some type of automated tool, um, it, and help them understand it, the bits and bytes and, and and how it all works. I think right now a lot of it is sort of uh, you know I think of Hira and some of the work that Hira has been doing. I know that there are other instances uh, in the United States that, that are doing sort of more case study based research around this. You've got Interparas. Um, as well at the University of British Columbia. But as far as I'm aware, I think, well, there was, I think there was some attempts in Liverpool to do something like this, those sort of computational archival um, uh, studies. And that was led by James Lowry, who's now at CUNY. Um, so I think that there are attempts. I, I just don't know how far along we are in terms of providing that space for students that are coming into the profession. I'm going to hand off to Jenny because I know this is, she's more knowledgeable in this than I am. Well, I'm less knowledgeable than I was because I left UCL in 2020. So I am no longer at UCL. I'm now um, back at the National Archives. But before I left UCL, I had been there for about 10 years and we'd done a lot in sort of developing the digital offer there um, around kind of exactly teaching this. And I think it is difficult because the curriculum is quite full and the more you add, the more overloaded the students get. Um, and that's not good for all sorts of reasons. We don't want to overload um, people coming into the profession and kind of um, give them so much, make their heads explode before they've even started. So I think there's an element of that that always needs to be considered, but I think it is hard. I mean, the way I normally answer this is to say how I've done it. And to some extent, I can speak from personal experience because the way that I do it is by always un trying to go deeper and deeper and get into the detail. I need to know how things work. So Anthea says that we need something now, we need a solution now, and the need is here now. And I agree with her, the need is here now. And people are already filling that need. And the people who are filling that need are quite often the commercial records management system suppliers yeah, and various other people in that kind of space, because they see that their sort of um, market perhaps is, is kind of wanting this sort of thing and they are putting it in there. But one of the things I'm doing as a, part of into Paris is I'm trying to kind of educate myself about what that actually means so if you look at the sales speak or you look at the kind of what's being promised but then you have to really dig under the hood and constantly ask well what actually is going on here and what are you doing and and that's that's what we need to teach the archivists as I think or the the trainee archivists it's this in some ways it's about being an intelligent client always about being an intelligent client and knowing knowing what you care about and what you care about is, is things like accountability and is things like transparency. And it is, you know, don't buy a system if you don't understand how it's working. Um, don't use a system in your own, you know, if you don't understand it. So I think that's my normal, my advice is just to kind of be really annoying and to just always ask why, how, how, how is that? No, tell me again. And if you can't explain it in the simple way that I understand, then, you know, that's a problem. You need to be able to communicate this to me. I may not be the world's greatest technical expert, but I can grasp the basic concepts. So you need to explain it to me. And, and that's what I do. And that's, like I say, it's quite annoying. Um, but I think it's the, I would encourage everybody to be an intelligent client and to not um, always look under the hood always ask more and don't fall for the emperor's new clothes, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, so I, I think on this, which is, which is a extremely important question, I'm, I'm very much an optimist. Uh, so I think, uh, I think there will be a very, there, there is a complete possibility to have a, um, a constructive and important convergence between uh, archives and, and AI. 
uh, in, in terms of education and teaching. And I think there is a lot of interest and demand for that. Um, what I would say is that um, I think this, this needs to happen not as a, how to say it, not, not as something that is, a, that is a necessary evil, but as something that is a, a, a lot of, that has a lot of potential and is kind of part of the next step of the future of the profession. So in, in an exciting way and not in a, in a way that is just uh, inflicted upon, uh, so to say. Um, and there is definitely an opportunity for that. Uh, least to mention the fact that the very community in, in AI is asking for contributions from, uh, more broadly speaking, the humanities, but in particular archivists in terms of how to handle their data, how to uh, develop protocols that are more transparent, et cetera, et cetera, all, all that we have discussed. Uh, so I think I would uh, definitely uh, see this as a, as a positive development, and I think it is happening uh, in, in certain places. Uh, there is a, a reasoning in that respect. There is a lot of demand from uh, the public sector, from the government, but also from the private sector for uh, this kind of training to happen in universities, which is good. And I also think that students are very, very interested uh, into that. So I wouldn't... Uh, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the need of keeping a barrier too low for them or that it's too difficult. I don't think so. I think they can definitely uh, do it, uh, provided the right motivation. And lastly, I think that technically the, the, um, the learning curve is lower, actually, because we're getting better in teaching machine learning and teaching data. Uh, and the tools are becoming less of a barrier because they are getting just better. Right? So the, the, it's, it's getting easier to learn how to program. It's getting easier to learn how to use these tools in practice. Uh, so this is broadening the audience that can access them. So all this combined, I think it's actually it makes for, in my opinion, a very exciting, promising future in terms of education. Yeah, and I do want to but, reiterate that I don't mean that the archive is too difficult for them. I think it's just, as you say, it's around identity formation. Um, and I think our identities are becoming more complex because, as you say, you know, am I an archivist anymore? I'm not sure, you know, or, you know, I, I kind of want to be that bridge and kind of be in the in the spaces in between. And the archivist in the spaces in between is great, but then you kind of lose your sense of identity. So it, it's it's more that when when archivists are in training, they're in a period of identity formation. And that's quite a difficult time to be just time and we all know how difficult it is to form our identities and our identities shift over time and change and, and they have to and you're right the sense you know the identity of the profession is is changing necessarily as we kind of that but I think it, it, it's it's sometimes difficult if you don't kind of acknowledge that it's a really hard time to sort of form your identity through that training process that's what I meant about overloading perhaps I can just clarify that. Can we, can we unpack that question of professional identity a bit more? Because all three of you have said that AI will not replace archivists, uh, that there's still a, a role. And yet we're also saying that it, in a way, is, is changing and affecting the, uh, the archival identity. Uh, so can, we, can, we, can you give me some more thoughts about how, how the archivist and, and the AI kind of find that optimal balance going forward? If, if it doesn't replace us, but it supports us, but in doing so, changes us. Talk a little bit about that that uh, that relationship, because I'm delighted to hear the enthusiastic uh, view about students coming through. But there's an awful lot of us are are already well and truly into the workforce and, and trying to 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 sort of strike a new balance and accommodate AI as part of our, our professional identities. So, I think Jenny said it best. I think it's about being the intelligent client. It's about not simply expecting the output, but then again, we never expected it when we were dealing with creators, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we did appraisal and selection with creators and creators, like this is what we should keep. And we're like, yeah, thanks for your advice. We'll take that under consideration, but we're actually going to look. So I think that it's, it's always kind of been part of our profession, perhaps an, an unacknowledged component of our profession. Um, so, and I, but I think that every profession changes like medicine in 1900 is not medicine of 2022. So I think it's just part of the natural progression uh, around 
how professions change. And I agree with Jenny, it, it, you know, we may need to sort of grapple with what does this mean to be an archivist in the 21st century, but we've been asking that question for like <laughs> 20 years. So I think it, it's just something that we naturally need to come to terms with. And, but I agree with you, John, I think that there is an element of there's, there's the training we get when we're at school. And then there's a whole component of professional ongoing training that we have to offer the profession more widely around, you know, these are the things that you need to be mindful of if you're gonna work with AI. It's not about learning programming. It's more about understanding as Jenny has done. It's, it's more about understanding how the components and the, everything works together in order to, to appreciate the output and how to get an output. And it's also, I think when we look at professional development, it's about not necessarily reinventing the wheel because I think when we get into these areas around emerging technologies, whether that's AI or blockchain or quantum computing, because that's another thing that's eventually gonna come down the road, it's, it's about where do we point to external sources that already exist that explain in plain English what it is these technologies do and then what specifically within our profession do we need to sort of break down and explain so that it's more understandable for those that are on the ground. I don't necessarily think there's, there's sort of a, a sort of a split personality that occurs when new, new technologies come into play. I think it's just about our profession is evolving. I think there is something about confidence though. I mean, I think that's perhaps maybe we, we don't lose our professional identity, but we do lose our professional confidence and we lose our professional confidence because we don't feel we can do it. If you see what I mean, we, 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 we don't get hands on, um, and so, you know, we're relying on somebody else and therefore we don't feel that because we, we like to be able to sort of speak, you know, firm of our ground, if you like. We like to be firm of our ground as, as archivists, because in some ways that's what we do. We kind of firm up the ground for everybody. You know, we firm up the ground for society and we try and kind of speak. So I think there is something about professional confidence. Um, and I think that that, again, comes down to sort of it's difficult. I don't quite know how you build up confidence. Um, I build up confidence quite often by pretending to be an idiot to some extent. I don't mind being an idiot. So, you know, I think that's difficult sometimes in some professional context when you just say, I have no idea what you're talking about, or can you explain that in, for an idiot, you know, idiot level and those kind of questions. It's quite difficult to kind of manage that balance. I mean, I'm lucky because I'm still in that kind of research space. But if I was, say, representing the National Archives for transfer, it's very difficult to then kind of you know act the idiot or pretend you don't you know or not pretend you don't know but kind of ask those silly questions it's quite difficult and that can be undermining perhaps a professional confidence so I think there is something about professional confidence but I don't quite know how you train for professional confidence if you see what I mean or how you in encourage professional confidence other than kind of giving people opportunities to try things out or giving people making a culture whereby saying you don't understand is fine Uh, I'll just add to this that um, I think uh, very very significant points and um, in, in my opinion it's two sided right so there, there is one, one thing is to 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 see at AI machine learning etc just as uh, yet another tool in the toolkit of archivists to do their job right and in that respect maybe I don't think it is as important as other dimensions of the archival profession that really are core to uh, to its identity, right? So, uh, so I would I would hope that that doesn't mean that archivists become, you know, data professionals because we already have data professionals. So it's another thing, right? So the, the core identity should be absolutely kept and and uh, and and uh, uh, cherished, I think, because it's very important in itself. Uh, there is another element which. I think speaks to to the, the the confidence. I think the journey that you were that you were mentioning, which is I think I, I think there is a demand for archivists actually in the world of AI, in the world of data, and this this is something that I, I really would like to see more of, um, and, and and perhaps also it it might come from having a more um, you know going outside of the context of arch, uh, archives and see where. Um, the principles, the skills, the, the expertise of archivists could be best applied. So you mentioned, for example, Jenny, uh, data sheets, right? So, so as, as a proposal that came in the, in the machine learning community, trying to talk directly to the expertise of archivists and even to, to call for that, 
for their participation in, uh, in, in machine learning. So I think this is, this is one example, but we also mentioned, of course, the important, increasingly important points about um, accountability, transparency, security, uh, fairness and bias in data, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think archivists could play uh, a much more significant role, much more active role in the world of data, in the world of, of machine learning, with their own identity and with their own uh, skills that are very much in need of. And, and maybe that will also contribute to, to the confidence of the profession in the 21st century or, or whatever, in the near future. Thank you. So just a reminder for everyone that's, that's on the call, if you want to ask a question or, or share some of your own experiences dealing uh, with issues around, uh, around AI and, and appraisal and selection and just AI supporting the professional work more generally, uh, please feel free to, to put up your hand or, or put a comment uh, into the chat. So I think one of the things that over today, tomorrow and Wednesday, we want to start fleshing out is what what do we need as additional tools or guidance or codification of, uh, uh, of, of issues to, to build that professional confidence that we're talking about? What, what could help, uh, help us navigate this landscape in terms of, of some, some articulations or, or even just questions to ask as the, uh, the intelligent uh, uh, client that you put it, Jenny? So I'm interested in any suggestions from, uh, uh, from the panel or from from the audience around the the things that we need or the where what questions we need need assistance answering or or assistance asking for that matter. What would help us navigate this territory more effectively? Jenny, you've gone on. Well, I think there's one, I mean, there's a question for Giovanni even before you've asked your question, but it is the same question. And that's kind of how, you know, it's like, yeah. how do we approach, you know, the trouble with kind of um, cross-disciplinary conversations or cross-professional conversations is that you don't necessarily know how to initiate them or how to kind yeah. of have those, you know, everybody has their own kind of norms about, you know, how they converse or how they discuss or who to talk to and it's kind of have you got any suggestions for the archival community about how they can kind of initiate contact you know is it just dropping a line to somebody locally or you know is there a, a way that it can be done at that kind of more I don't know community level I don't know just a question Yeah, well, I think there are there are many ways, many ways I uh, probably have, we're already doing and we have already been involved with, uh, and uh, perhaps they, they they might benefit from a little bit of consolidation going forward. Uh, so, of course, I mean, myself and others here, we come from the world of research, right? So, which is uh, there, it's it's like the business to to experiment new things. So, it's a little bit easier to to start projects and 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 and, and play with things and uh, and do experiments and the like. Um, looking at those kind of collaborations, which I think are uh, are going in the right direction, have been shown definitely the potential for the application of AI in an archival context. Um, in, in my personal view, they might be in need for for some consolidation. Um, so there are definitely key challenges that that are also related to the the unfortunate lack of resources sometimes, right? Really, in terms of money and IT resources and and uh, and, and people and experts, uh, which uh, pose a barrier to the consolidation of experiences into something that is more systematic. Uh, and this is definitely beyond me <laughs> to, to, to give an answer to that. Uh, but I think that if uh, research collaborations could be consolidated, first of all, at the level of communities talking together, so the, the um, discussions and shared experiences that become shared practices that becomes eventually become eventually guidelines and standards i think that would be one step another step would be to think about scalable solutions think about discussing with communities such as research software engineering open science and those kind of uh, experiences and uh, and communities in order to make uh, to bring experiments into something that is more scalable and can be used by others without reinventing the wheel. That would be another, uh, another option. And then a third option, definitely what we have already mentioned, which is, I think, ed education, right? So trying to be connected with the world of education, seeing what are the needs, and then having uh, maybe a tighter connection with where education takes place in universities, 
with job placements, internships, and the like, so that uh, those those uh, that core identity can be transmitted at the same time that new skills are acquired. So these are just a few a few ideas on, on my end. Thanks, Mark. Do you want to chip in? Uh, yeah, just because I've, I've got to go in a few minutes. Um, it's been really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to talk about, um, so a lot of focus is on the kind of algorithmic side of machine learning. Um, and, and as Giovanni said, you know, the tools are getting much better. You can um, implement things that might have been state of the art five years ago in 10 lines of code now. It's, it's remarkable. Um, so there's a kind of engineering and IT side of things to the, to the pipeline. But the big the most important thing is the data that goes in and there's a kind of emerging um, uh, research area of, of what's been called data driven AI, where the idea is that you you fix a model and then you work on the data to get the results out so you don't touch the machine learning side as well. So you could imagine a kind of fixed architecture, a fixed pipeline and you interact through the data. Um, and so that 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 area they're hoping to kind of develop more on the tools because that's the hard bit is is pre-processing preparing and selecting the data to feed into the into the algorithms themselves um, and that's an area we can we, the archival community could definitely have some impact on as well and, and and engage with is is how we develop those tools and be able to feed in knowledge and and all these things to, to get good good results without worrying about the engineering side Thanks. So if I can chime in quickly. So I completely agree with Mark. I think one of the big challenges, and this is a conversation we had for a long time, uh, was getting a data set big enough to train. And I think that that is definitely something that the community could pull together. I think when we look at the broader picture about what are the questions to ask, I think the archival community internationally needs to sit down and have that conversation. It's like, what, you know, we can talk about interdisciplinary research, which I think is absolutely the way forward. But I think that there are some core questions that we as a community have that we need to kind of sit down and flesh out together, whether it's through a virtual medium like this or during a conference or whenever it happens to be, um, to really start to plumb, what do we want to understand? What's the sort of, what's the plan? what's the progression model here what's the immediate need what's the sort of you know three to five years down the line what's the future sort of trying to pin down the future in an emerging technology environment and you know there's challenges there but I think it, it's sort of what is the progression model starting to look like and where is the overall community need so that we know when we're reaching out to colleagues like Giovanni or to other data scientists or computer programmers is that we we come with sort of a pre-baked this is our problem this is kind of what we're trying to we're trying to crack um and potentially start building, or as much as we possibly can, uh, a data, a, a set of data that can be then used to try and help train a machine. Now, can we train a machine that will answer all of our questions? No, but are there some basic questions there that we can start tackling that cross cuts, you know, jurisdictions, uh, geopolitics, all of these types of things. And, and I think that there are, um, but I think we need, to, we need to sit down as a collective and start figuring out what that means for us. I think there's some difficulty again about when we say what questions do we need to ask because I think we've had we've kind of been in this situation before as well with kind of new technology and grasping new technology and there's a difference between a kind of almost a use case what do we need the technology to do or we can probably break that down into a kind of series of kind of almost requirements technical requirements what do we need so we need perhaps something that can flag up if the content seems to be suggesting a different date to the metadata. We can narrowly define tasks, but sometimes those aren't necessarily going to be the questions that are going to interest researchers because researchers also want to kind of do novel science or push the field forward. So some of the kind of, I think there's a little, we just need to be careful about kind of at what level we're pitching our questions and, and how our questions are kind of structured. So I think I don't want to fall into the trap perhaps of us again, perhaps becoming passive consumers in this um, you know we're setting out our use cases this is what we need it to do somebody build it for us it's more can we pitch our questions so that we're kind of asking interesting problems and we become part of the people devising the solutions rather than 
the kind of people waiting for somebody to build the solution. And it's just because that seems to have happened in the past that I think it's just something to be wary of. But I don't know how we do it, but it's a concern. But I think, to my concern here as well is that the conversation around AI has been really one sided in terms of who's been able to participate in the conversation. And when I talk about bringing the community together, it's that I want to hear from colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa. I want to hear from colleagues in South America. I want to hear from colleagues in the Pacific Islands because these technologies have far ranging impacts. And we need to, if we're gonna talk about this internationally, we need colleagues from all over the world around the table so that we have a better overview. And I think we don't have a good overview right now. I think you look at, who the panelists are on this call, no offense, Giovanni, no offense, Jenny, and, but it's, it's like we, we need to have a more rounded conversation within the community so that we know what it is we're asking and, and, or in what context, in what regions we need to ask these questions because what, is, what, is, what we are looking for may be completely all over the spectrum. And so it, it's how do we sort of modulate what it is that we need to do. But I think that there are very real needs. When I look at the deployment of, and we're, we're kind of getting off the topic around AI and appraisal and selection, but it has an impact on appraisal and selection around deployment of AI in development initiatives and in Sub-Saharan Africa and the impact this has on citizens and how government makes decisions because they're, they're using these technologies in order to satisfy you know, the initiatives that are being done by the World Bank or the initiatives that are being done by the UN in order to create more transparency and, and more accountability and decision-making. It's that this has to be captured at a later point by institutions that have no technical infrastructure to be able to do this or you know limited capabilities uh, in terms of, of uh, training and so I think when, when I talk about having that conversation it's trying to get that overview of what it is that we're dealing with as a community um, in order that we can have at the international level advocacy because I think there's a whole question around how the community advocates for itself and its needs and some of the very real ethical issues that AI brings so there's a high level discussion at the international level, but whoever the new executive director is needs to understand this. So these conversations need to happen so that when they are reaching out to sort of data scientists or computer scientists or the professional equivalent, the organizational professional equivalent at the international level, they know what the, the big problems are so that we can start having an advocacy discussion or when, you know, UNESCO just developed uh, a code, it was, I don't know if it's a code of ethics, but it's sort of like a code of ethics. And the fact that it was only member countries that could really contribute to that code of ethics and archives was completely left out. Like you look at the archival component around this and the focus was entirely on access. There was nothing about the complexities of appraisal and selection and all of these types of things. So I think that there is a broad brush discussion that needs to happen so we can take into account some pretty significant issues aside from simply the technical use cases that we may take to some of the communities to say, you know, help us or rather help us develop it rather than you develop it for us. So, Anthea, thanks for, I guess that was a, a really great summary of the fact while we started with discussion around uh, archival appraisal and selection and the interface with AI, what I think we've unpacked in this, this discussion is that that's, that's one facet of a, a far more profound conversation about how AI works in society, the role of archivists, not just as consumers of that uh, technology, but also as uh, shaping it. And Giovanni's optimism about that, that there's, a, there's a real call for us to, to get actively involved and bring our professional expertise into the, the future development of, of how these still fairly uh, raw, albeit very impactful technologies uh, evolve the, the increasing push that we're seeing in interdisciplinary spaces around data ethics needing to uh, to inform the conversation. I think with this, this is, is really fertile ground that I know we'll, we'll explore over the next couple of days. But I think perhaps the last question I want to, to ask you to, to uh, reflect on this morning is, is how this conversation, how you would like this conversation to be different uh, in 10 years time. So uh, we've You've all mentioned how rapidly evolving the uh, both the, the consumption and the supply side of, of, of AI is, how we're learning how it works, how we can deploy it for 
uh, for value. So um, given the, the big, big questions that we've been talking about, what, what would you like to think will be the sort of state of play uh, in, in 10 years time? And that's, I know it's quite far into a crystal ball to gaze when it comes to, uh, to some of these emerging tech spaces, but if, just to, to wrap up the conversation, let's, let's play ourselves forward a decade. Who wants to go first? I don't want to be having this conversation in 10 years. <laughs> um, that's one. And we're notorious. I love archivists. I love my profession, but we're notorious for continuing to have this conversation. Um, but what I would manifestly like to see is that we have some workflows that are that are existing or the some practices that are existing that can that are helping us make using artificial and machine learning, artificial intelligence um, in appraisal and selection. And it, there'll be challenges, of course, but that's what I would like to see in 10 years, but I'll be having this conversation in 10 years with no solutions. Uh, yes, briefly, very much agreed. I mean, with, with Antea, um, I, I mean, not that I don't want to have conversations, but it, it says that I think, I think we, will have, we will have moved beyond that. Um, beyond the need to have it, I think for me it would be it would be nice to to essentially see AI as a as a, a really part of the of the archivist toolkit, uh, something that we don't we don't uh, still need to negotiate and, and understand how to use and when etc. Uh, so something a little bit more more, more uh, normalized, but also become really part of of, of the toolkit in a, in, a, in, a, in a natural way. And what I like to, to see are, um, um, yeah, again, what I mentioned before, more, more guidelines, standards, accepted standards, you know, that how to use AI. I think this is a, this is a key uh, contribution from archivists that I, I expect in, in, in the next 10 years, I hope we'll, we'll do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to agree. I don't want to be having. <laughs> I don't want to be having this conversation in ten years. I don't want AI to be a thing in ten years that we have to talk about, because um, there'll be more interesting things to talk about by that point. I mean, I think on, I think on the guidelines. I mean, I think it would be nice to have some kind of. Uh, I don't know about guidelines, but kind of um, an, a common understanding, a shared understanding, perhaps of of of, of the technology. That perhaps we don't necessarily have at the moment. We don't have a shared understanding of of it and what it means for from different perspectives. Um, so I think a shared understanding of you know what it means and kind of it it, it having meaning for 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 a, for a range of people would be good. But um, like I say, not having this conversation again. And I agree that it'd be nice to have some sort of implementation of it because i think as soon as as soon as it's in practice then it's in practice and we don't have to have this conversation in theory because we're doing it in practice it's just let's, let's just get on with it <laughs> thanks jenny so thank you thank you all uh panelists out there jenny giovanni it was a you know, a really wide-ranging and, and very uh insightful discussion that we've had i think that that call to action that we should not treat this as a 10 year conversation, but let's actually uh, make sure that we're, we're using AI in all sorts of ways for, uh, including for selection and, and appraisal well within 10 years, uh, that we've got those common understandings, those standards and guidance, uh, and that we are being active, confident participants in that, uh, that evolution rather than just in 10 years time. Uh, picking the best product that is, uh, is being thrust down our throats. Uh, I think this has really put us on a, on a great track for more discussions over the next couple of days and starting to, uh, to take, take some of this rich conversation and, and shape it up into some of those standards, uh, some of that confidence, some of, that, uh, some of those workflows that we've, uh, uh, you've all been calling for. So huge thanks to, uh, to the panelists and to the uh, the other presenters earlier today, I and mean, just a reminder: the Mark and Paul and Shanti showed us that this is this is already happening. It's not just a, an abstract conversation. So that ten year vision that you talked about is is starting today. You know, it, it's there's already people using using these uh, uh, these technologies. So it, it's it's not purely in the hypothetical realm. Uh, and to everyone that, that joined the call, hopefully there was. Uh, uh, some interesting takeaways and hopefully you'll come back for more over the next uh, next couple of days. Uh, appreciate that uh, each of you will be coming to these questions from a, a different context, both a, a different national, institutional and personal context. Uh, but I uh, 
uh, I hope that uh, this has helped equip all of you to, to either be more confident in your institutional setting or to feel more equipped as a, as a professional dealing with these issues. So thank you all uh, and wish you a uh, great rest of the day and uh, hope to see folk back tomorrow for the, for the second installment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.